Here's another exclusive clip from Wrestling Reality with Justin Labar, brought to you by Gladiators of the Cage. Corporate companies that can always uh, present and, and spin things however they want, uh, and, and especially if you are uh, not a math person, if you chose broadcasting like myself, then you're sitting there looking at these numbers going, what the hell? So to bring it in, to make it understandable for, for us uh, in layman's terms and to have a no spin on it, bringing in a, a guy who runs WrestleNomics.com, is also a contributor and has uh, several other projects, uh, breaking down pro wrestling in the state of its analytics. You can follow him on Twitter at Mookie Ghana, M-O-O-K-I-E-G-H-A-N-A. He is Chris Harrington. Chris, how are you? I'm doing, I'm doing great, Justin. Great to have, be on the show with you. Yeah, thanks for coming on, taking the time. Uh, first, I got to ask, what is the what's what's the story behind the Twitter uh, handle here? <laughs> Um, I've been known as Mookie for for a long time, uh, going all the way back to when I was a, a teenager and and hanging out in upstate New York doing wrestling stuff. So I've been Mookie for a while, and then when I was in college, I actually studied abroad in the West African country of Ghana. So Mookie Ghana was kind of a natural uh, name at that point, and just the name I've been using ever since. Did you discover Kofi Kingston? <laughs> Let's say uh, uh, Kofi, Kofi uh, speaks a little tree, which is uh, the language uh, the, that I learned to speak a little bit of there. So if I ever see him, I, one time I tried to speak to Prince Nana in tree, and he did not respond, even though he's supposedly a Ghanaian prince as well. So <laughs> you, you exposed the work. That's, that's not a good thing. Yeah, it's what it felt like, but well, hey, I'm going happen. I'm going to stick with calling you Chris, if that's okay. That's A-OK. -okay. <laughs> Chris, uh, WrestleNomics.com, uh, you got a blog talk radio podcast. Uh, you, know, you appear on several other um, uh, publications and shows, uh, you, you really, and I, you're my go-to guy on my Twitter timeline whenever anything of financials comes up with WWE because you, you really do a good job breaking it down and explaining. So um, so I wanted to do some of that right here on the show. Uh, first, let's let's start off here. The third quarter earnings report was last Thursday, uh, and, uh, and, I, and correct me anywhere if I get something wrong, but my, my, I guess my first question and topic to you, uh, if I understand right, last year and the entire, over the four quarters, WWE uh, got $176 million in their TV rights, but here we're only three quarters over, and they've already got $175 million. Uh, is that correct? And, and, and what's the explanation of this? Because we've been hearing the doom and gloom about ratings being down. So how does this make sense? So WWE signed contracts in the middle of 2014 that began in the end of 2014 and the first quarter of 2015. And they had seven key big contracts they renewed, including the U.S. contract with them with NBC Universal, their U.K. contract with Sky Sports, and then a big new contract with India, and then some other contracts, Mexico, UAE, Thailand, you know, not, not places that we normally think of as WWE hotbeds necessarily. But those contracts had a deal in them that said, every quarter we will pay you more for each hour of programming. And so they have built in escalators. So essentially, WWE gets to collect all that money starting in Q4 of 2014, and every single quarter they make more money per hour of television that they air. And the only variation that there is is that if they air more Total Divas episodes, if they add Tough Enough or something like that, it will change a little bit. But beyond that, it's, it's pretty much just going to be they make more money for each show that they're airing. So a lot of the WWE's new deal was, you know, 40%, 50% increase over where they were the year before. So that's really what, what is keeping WWE afloat right now as they, they try and kind of work through the transition with the WWE Network. Does that kind of explain then, you know, especially when the Internet wrestling fans get all up in arms and are like, you know, look at the rating, they need to, you know, fire the writer, this and that. Does this kind of explain why WWE maybe doesn't panic as much as the uh, IWC does because they are, they, are, they are getting what's important, which is money for their television programming? So WWE gets paid exactly the same number of dollars regardless of what their rating is every week, short of literally being canceled or TV station not paying their bills. So, and, and as silly as that sounds, both of those are always possibilities. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they don't make any more or less money. Now, does that to say they don't care about ratings? They no-sold it on the conference call when someone asked them. But the reality is they do care about ratings, and there's three reasons for that. Number one... NBC Universal cares a lot about ratings, and they're the ones who are paying the bills. And in a couple of years, WWE is going to have to go to them hat in hand and try to get a new contract. So they care a lot about keeping them happy. Number two, advertisers pay a lot about WWE. And so the decision, for instance, to move SmackDown onto the USA Network next year, part of that is because advertisers are going to have to make the decision about, do I want to continue to advertise on USA knowing that I'm going to get this wrestling demographic? So it's going to make a difference to how USA wants to deal with the product and so forth. And the last one, which is I think the big one, is fans for the WWE Network are people that supposedly are watching their product. So if you have less people watching your product, you have less people who are out there buying merchandise, going to live events, and, of course, ordering the 
WWE Network. So I think ratings does matter to the company as much as they try to pretend it doesn't. Let's talk WWE Network. Obviously, that's been the number one issue and the hot-button issue for the last year and a half since it launched, uh, coming up on two years now. Uh, how is it doing? Where, where is its network uh, subscriber count at, and is it viewed as a success right now? So as of September 30th, 2015, they had 1.23 million paid subscribers. Now, that was up from the June 30 number of about 1.15 million, but down from the March 31st number of 1.33 million. And if you think about when WrestleMania was, of course, that was when the peak of subscribership was. What's interesting is you get into this number where you'd call average paid over the quarter. And what has been intriguing about that is even though there was that high number in 331 because they added the U.K. market in January, they actually only averaged about 927,000 people during the first quarter of the year. The second quarter of the year, they averaged a little over a million, and the third quarter, they averaged about 1.1 million. So in terms of actually average number of people paying, they're generating more revenue right now on the WWE Network than they ever have before, even though WrestleMania was really the peak subscribership. A lot of people came in, and a lot of people left. And that's really been the issue with the WWE Network, is they have what they call churn, which is all the people who cancel each quarter, and then they have gross additions, the number of people that you add in. And so what's unusual about the WWE Network is that your last, last quarter in Q3, they had 376,000 people leave the service and 453,000 join the service. Now, why exactly you're having hundreds of thousands of people constantly coming in and coming out? A lot of people have different theories. Some people are going to say that's people gaming the system with the free network trials. Other people say it has to do with international to domestic. And some of it is probably just people who are trying out the service and want to watch, you know, Sting's pay-per-view, and then they don't want to watch something else. So there's a lot of stuff going on with it. They are not at the expectations that they set back in January of 2014 when they first launched this service. But I'd say over the last year when they've kind of tried to redefine what the expectations are, they're doing a pretty decent job along that track, even though Wall Street's not that impressed. Well, and I'd imagine, I think, uh, I don't know if they already did or if it's supposed to be this month, them going into India. India is a huge market. I'd have to imagine that's going to be nothing but positive for them. You know, I think India might, and not to disagree, but I do disagree, because I think it might be the most overrated thing that they've tried to push as a narrative. I think in the long term, for sure, it's a big market. It's a big opportunity. But there's, there's three different strikes against this India deal. Number one, it's going to be 9.99 US currency, which is a relatively high price in that marketplace. Number 2, pay-per-views are blacked out for 24 hours before they'll be available on the network. So one of the biggest draws to the network is not even actually going to be live there in India because they already signed a pay-per-view deal with some Indian subscribe TV networks. And number three, it's a broadband solution just like it is in the U.S. And if you actually look at the Indian marketplace, people like YouTube have actually developed kind of offline viewing mechanisms on your mobile phone. So you can almost go into a, a cyber cafe in India, download content, and then watch it offline because they recognize that it's so spotty and so hard for people to have that kind of coverage. So I think down the line, yeah, it's going to be big for them. But right now, I really don't think it's going to move the subscriber number. Well, with those points two and three there, especially with the pay-per-view being blacked out and then, and then the, the broadband, that actually, I did not know that, so that, that kind of changes my opinion. That, that made, that, I can see why you would say it's an overrated, uh, overrated narrative. Again, we're talking to Chris Harrington. You can follow him on Twitter at Mookie Ghana. Uh, Chris, uh, all things WrestleNomics. Uh, Chris, a few more questions for you while we have you. Um, uh, they, they tout a lot about the social media and how, 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 how many followers John Cena has and how they were the number one trending thing this night. Obviously, we know you can make money off of YouTube ads, and, and they, have a, they have a successful YouTube channel, it seems. But with this Twitter and Facebook and all the touting here uh, with that, can they make money off of social media, or is this just a bunch of, uh, just a bunch of you know, smoke to, to blow up uh, their own butts? You know, it's, it's easy to say both answers to that. Number one, I do think it's a bunch of hype because the amount of money they're actually making in the digital media realm is paltry. I'm talking less than a couple million a year. Okay. You know, they, the equivalent of what they were making on, like, Snickers advertisements back in the, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. Right. So it's nothing compared to what, what you, even the Hulu rights are almost nothing at all. Now, on the flip side, WWE's narrative is this. Back in the 80s, we had cable TV. Nobody thought cable was worth anything. We were there. We grew an audience. And lo and behold, cable became this giant revenue source for us down the line. And so they saw it as what's coming up is we're going to be doing this WWE um, presence online. Eyeballs are going to be there. And in a couple of years, when 
the world of money catches up to this, hey, we'll be making lots of money because we'll have an unfair share of the marketplace where when you think of wrestling, you think of WWE and you go to our product. So there's some truth to that, but I think, you know, it's like asking, is cord cutting real and what's going to happen to media rights in four years? If anybody really knew, they'd go off and be a billionaire. They wouldn't just be speculating on the radio. Fair point. Finally, uh, this is actually something that came up last night in a conversation as we were all on Twitter live from Internet Raw, and I said I was going to ask you about this. Uh, you made a mention in, in a conversation on Twitter um, and, uh, about the McMahons having a class of stock that gives them more voting rights, if I have that correct. What, what does that mean? What, explain that to me. So when WWE became a public company, they established two classes of their stock. They call it Class A and Class B stock. So when you or and I invest in WWE stock, we get Class A stock. There's a second class called the Class B stock, which is only limited to McMahon family owners. I think it has something like eight people that actually own the stock. And the difference between the two is is that you get ten times the voting rights as someone who owns Class A shares. So the voting rights determine things like who's on the board of directors. So essentially, the McMahon family can 100% control who's on the board of directors, and by that, by proxy, essentially stop someone from taking over the company or saying, hey, you should merge with this company or sell this unit or do anything else, any kind of shareholder activism. So I think something like 90% of all voting rights are controlled by the McMahon family directly. And it's, so, it's written in such a way that it actually says if someone whose last name is not McMahon owns this, these shares, they automatically become Class A stockholders. So it's not even something like you can gift it to someone who's not in the family. Even if that happened, it would become a Class A share. So they essentially can control their company. So anytime people are like, I can't believe so-and-so invested in WWE, they're an activist shareholder, they're going to do something, I laugh because there's, there's no basis for that. Because basically Vince McMahon can control his own company pretty much until the day he decides not to control his own company. And I think that has a huge impact on the business decisions this company will have down the line. Well, obviously it's <clears throat> obviously it's legal because they've been doing it uh, since they've been a public company in '99. But it, it, is something like this? Do they do something like this to prevent, you know, what happened to WCW when, when you know when a merger took place that basically you know killed the comp that killed WCW? Is that is that kind of the idea here is to make sure that it stays in the family and they they control their own destiny? Yeah, and in fact, they're actually really clear about that. If you ever said they they put out their annual report every year, it's called a 10K. If you go to the sec.gov and look up WWE and read their 10K, they're very transparent about the fact that they do they have this kind of structure so that they can um, basically control the transactions, that they can keep there from being a hostile takeover, that they have no way of no fear of that ever happening, and that they can make the decisions that they think are appropriate for them. I always tell people, though, you can't have one person who's going to replace Vince McMahon down the line. It'll be like four or five people because no one is doing as many things as he is doing right now feasibly in the future. It's only by the fact that he's inherited this position that he can retain being chairman of the board, president of the company, head of creative, and all the other decision-making powers that he has. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because I, I often think people, you know, especially people that aren't really – regular wrestling fans, you know, like bosses here at the Pittsburgh Trib, they'll ask me, oh, well, what happens when Vince McMahon you know, dies? And I always say, well, you know, Triple H and Stephanie will probably be handling a lot of the day-to-day wrestling stuff, but then I think, that, would that be the time that Shane McMahon comes in and handles more of the boardroom stuff? Because obviously Shane's been a very uh, successful businessman. I, I always wonder uh, you know, exactly how the replacement will go in terms of by committee of who will take what roles. You know, I really think the biggest player in WWE right now is their CFO, Chief Strategy Officer, a guy named George Berrios. Mm -hmm. And he is a former, you know, he was like the New York Times treasurer or something. But he has basically wound his way into WWE. And if you listen to these conference calls, it's 90% Berrios, 10% Vince. Mm -hmm. Vince doesn't talk a lot anymore. And almost all the business decisions and the business strategy is being driven by Berrios. And so I would not be surprised that... If anything, unless there was a major falling out between, you know, Paul Levesque and George Berrios, Berrios is going to be a guy who's going to get more and more power for the time being. Interesting stuff. Chris, this has been great. Uh, again, check out Chris on Twitter. Uh, he's great. Again, whenever they have these uh, earnings reports or whenever any information comes out about, you know, WWE Network and money and finances, uh, Chris is a great guy to uh, go to on your social media. You can follow him at Mookie Ghana, M-O-O-K-I-E-G-H. A N A. Uh, you can go there, and it has all of his links to uh, the podcast and to his, his blog and, and everything he does, uh, keeping us up to date in the world of uh, WWE finances. Chris, thanks so much for taking the time. This uh, has been very educational, probably the most educational segment we've ever had uh, on this show. So I appreciate you doing it. I appreciate being on. Have a great show. Talk to you later, Justin. Thanks, Bye. Chris.